Okay, thank you for giving this chance. Um, the topic today I will present about the simulation-based procedure skill training. Um, I have presented uh, uh, a topic about this one uh, in the uh, one of the chapter of the GCSA before in 2019. And um, I would like to share with you the um, current advances in the simulation-based procedure skill training. As we all know, um, the uh, procedure skills, uh, before that, I have no any financial disclosure to disclose with this presentation, and it's just uh, presenting it for educational purposes. So basically, we we know that the the skill training is something very important in uh, the medical field as we train our um, junior doctors, uh, residents, interns, and medical students about performing procedures. And as we all aware that the procedures has two components, which is the technical and non technical skills. Both of those sides are, are quite important for uh, the future doctors uh, to, to treat their patients. Uh, but probably most of the research uh, now are concentrating on the uh, technical uh, part of it, as the non-technical, as kind of uh, still it needs some um, modification in the learning process uh, because Usually, the 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 medical personnel start as novice in any procedural skills they want to learn, and then their learning curve progress uh, from the advanced beginner, competent, profession, till they reach the expert uh, level of that one. And for each of these uh, performance level, there is some certain criteria, and. We as uh, um, medical personnel, uh, we are legally bound to those um, stages of performance, i.e. Uh, there is some certain procedures or certain privilege you can do while you are a proficient doctor, while you cannot perform it uh, in the novice level. Uh, i.e. in the novice level, you have to perform some certain uh, procedures under supervision of uh, a senior level of performance. Over the history of the um, medical field, there is kind of lots of research has happened in to discover the best way to uh, learn those uh, skills and to progress from novice level uh, up to the expert level. You see the learning curve is kind of quite steep, but um, there is lots of obstacles in that one. Um, we all know that the traditional way of learning, as we all learn, is we the, the, the principle of see one, uh, do one, and teach one. These are the uh, Holisterian way of training, i.e. we follow seniors, we see what seniors do, and then we do that one, and then later on we become senior and teach it to our junior doctors. That is the way the uh, traditional way of training or the Holisterian uh, as was discovered by this gentleman from 1852 to 1922. But basically there is lots of problems with this way of training at the moment. And um, this has been kind of evident by um, the training hours. So in the Holy Stadium or the traditional way of training, we usually, um, it is kind of a time-based, i.e. we spend some certain time in some specialty or to train procedures, i.e. we spend one year like in uh, neurosurgery or cardiac surgery or in the other hand, neuroanesthesia or cardiac anesthesia, and then we certify as competent in that field. However, the problems of this uh, way of training especially with the high expectation at the moment from our patients, from our administrators, from our community, uh, that has led to force the training body to look for other way of training. The other thing is the training time is reduced as was evident by things like uh, European Working Time Directive, and obviously uh, not too far the pandemic of the COVID-19 has reduced the contact between trainees and the patients. Uh, for all that, the, the training body has been forced to move from the time-based to competency-based uh, training, i.e. the competency of the trainee should be assessed 
in um, kind of a way that declare that them as competent to perform the procedure. So we 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 follow our trainee our trainees or junior doctors, and we train them and we certify them as competent, then they can perform procedures in their own uh, without supervision. It is quite different from the uh, traditional way of training. So th this move from time-based to competency-based uh, has, we, we have to find some ways of um, uh, facilitating this shift from time-based to competency-based. And the uh, simulation industry has given us most of those ways of uh, facilitating the way of training. Um, simulation has been for a long time in the industry, but probably um, the most people who have used simulation is the aviation industry, but in the medical field, it has been used in anesthesiology for a long time, but basically it was kind of, um, most of it as a computerized way of training. But now simulation in title, uh, a bigger field than what it has been believed before. So it, it uh, 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 simulation is, uh, provides a safe environment for uh, trainees to learn procedural skills but without uh, endangering patients. So simulation facilitate this uh, learning experience. And then once those junior doctors or residents has been certified that they are competent, then they can go and perform procedures on patients. And with that, we will um, be sure that those junior doctors are safe enough to perform procedures on, uh, on, on patients. Uh, with that, so simulation facilitated this effective learning outside the clinical uh, environment. But now simulation, as I said, is more than um, a programmed mannequins or a computerized interactive uh, programs. It should be, uh, simulation should be integrated with a curriculum. So the curriculum is a major part from the simulation learning experience and it should be as well facilitated by a valid and reliable uh, assessment. And this uh, experience usually um, forms uh, part of a whole program. So you deliver a curriculum in a simulation environment and you assess the progress of your doctors with a valid and objective assessment tool. So you use uh, obviously formative feedback, you use deliberate practice, you use all those uh, things which facilitate to deliver your curriculum uh, in a safe environment. Um, <clears throat> and actually, as, I, as it will be clear in the following slides now, the people will set a benchmark. So what, what is meant by a benchmark that is the level of uh, performance that you want those trainees or novice performers to achieve. So you should lift them that from a novice uh, level to an expert level, and you should assessment that they are um, competent enough to perform those procedures before they go and perform on patients. Okay, so um, it is uh, it, the idea from that one. So you, you shift from a fundamental base to an only innovative base, and this is all to improve the patient's outcome. So the ultimate goal is to improve patient's outcome. So fundamentals like simulation uh, learning, as I said, deliberate practice, um, computer-based curriculum to the innovative um, levels, which is kind of web-based learning, artificial intelligence, eye tracking, and the virtual uh, reality. Probably one of the um, landmark studies in the uh, surgical field is the uh, what was uh, known as a VR to OR. And in that one, um, Seymour and his colleague that prove uh, that the virtual reality training improves the operating room uh, performance, and that was um, a randomized, double-blinded study. 
And uh, with that one as well, they proved that the proficiency-based virtual reality training reduced the error rate uh, for residents during their uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Um, having said that, uh, we have to know that the surgical, both surgical and anesthesia field have been forced to look for other ways of training. And this has been forced by the introduction of new skills. Uh, and new skills was evidence in uh, minimally invasive surgery and surgery and the introduction of uh, technologies like ultrasound guided nerve blocks in anesthesiology. So those those two things or the more kind of focus, um, fine skills have forced the training body to look for different ways or different modalities of training uh, apart from the whole stadium or the traditional way of, uh, of training. Um, so um, the, the, the idea behind the VR to our uh, study uh, came from the development, as I said, in the simulation industry and the uh, more people came out with ideas in the uh, simulation-based medical training. And one of those is the um, landmark um, publication of the book of Fundamentals of Surgical Simulation. And in that book, uh, those two guys, um, Tony Gallagher and uh, Jerry O'Sullivan, the late Jerry O'Sullivan, have uh, kind of revolutionized the way we train uh, new doctors and they provide new paradigm uh, in the uh, in the training of in the medical field uh, so this uh, uh, <clears throat> this publication has um, basically stressed in the fact that uh, developing the curriculum for the simulation based medical training uh, should be uh, quite uh, detailed in the sense that each procedure should be deconstructed in what we call metric-based simulation. So this entitled characterization of each procedure and then validation of those uh, uh, building blocks uh, before you put them into a training curriculum for the simulation. As we said previously, simulation worked very good but it should be incorporated uh, well with a very valid uh, curriculum. And this valid curriculum will entitle, obviously, um, a clear curriculum of training and a clear assessment tool for the progression of the trainees. So uh, this procedure characterization will yield once you deconstruct or uh, characterize any procedure, say take any procedure like laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So you characterize that one or you deconstruct the task of performing the laparoscopic cholecystectomy, that will give you what we call performance metrics. And those performance metrics will um, describe the optimal performance of the, of the procedures, uh, i.e. a straightforward performance uncomplicated performance. So the metrics are the steps of the procedures, uh, any procedure or a discrete task you describe, okay, but it should be a reference approach. A reference approach that means uh, an approach that uh, people will agree about it. Not, ne not necessarily they, they all of those experts, they do the same approach to the performance, but definitely they have to agree this is an optimal uh, performance, and then they will characterize that one to uh, define what we call metrics or the building blocks of the procedures. So it, it should entitle how this procedure should be performed, in what order, um, what instruments we will use, how we will use these instruments, and what should not be done, i.e. what errors we should uh, avoid when performing the procedure. Okay, so this will entitle, as you can see from this diagram, is any new skills or procedures. So you have to perform, uh, based on this methodology, you have to perform a procedure characterization and the procedure characterization will yield what we call metrics. And those metrics should be very well defined. Well defined, unambiguously defined and so that 
a person can um, score the performance of the trainees as occurred or not occurred. Okay, so once those metrics are defined, identified first by the procedure characterization and defined unambiguously, then they should go into a validation process. And we will see in a minute what validation will entitle because this step is very important. So once those metrics are uh, defined uh, and validated, then we will set a proficiency standard or, or as I said previously, a benchmark which is a performance benchmark that the trainee should achieve before they go and perform the procedures on uh, patients. How they will attain that uh, proficiency benchmark by deliberate practice in a simulated environment, okay? And that will incorporate other things like formative uh, feedback. Validation is something very important and that should uh, assure uh, the simulation community about the phase content of those metrics, the uh, how they are constructed, i.e. I they can differentiate between different level of performance. So if I use those metrics to assess uh, a group of persons from the assessment by using those metrics, I will know what level each of these personnel will fit on. Is Are they a novice? Are they an advanced beginners? Are they um, an expert? Are they a proficient? Are they a competent? So this, if they achieve that one, that means construct validity is achieved, as well as reliability. So reliability also is very important, and that will test um, that the when two persons use the same uh, assessment tool to assess personnel performing the same procedures, so their internet reliability should not be less than 80%. So they should agree on 80% of those metrics, not less than that. If more, the more they agree on, that means the reliability is more strong. So both those items should be there on the uh, identified metric, i.e. The they should be valid and they should be reliable uh, to be a uh, good assessment tool. And that will 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 categorize them as an objective and transparent and fair uh, assessment. So, so it's all about creating confidence around the assessment tool or the uh, developed uh, metrics. Um, so, with those with this methodology on mind, there is kind of lots of uh, studies came around on new skills, as I said. Uh, minimally invasive surgery and ultrasound uh, guided nerve blocks and robotic surgery. So this is kind of one of the leading uh, studies on proficiency-based progression training for robotic surgery skills. And it's a randomized uh, clinical trial. And you see the, um, the authors have um, randomized surgical residents, uh, 36 into two groups, one group receive a traditional training, i.e. that they receive e-learning without metrics, and then they undergo proficiency-based progression skill lab training, and then they are objectively uh, assessed using uh, video recording. The other group, which is a proficiency-based progression training, uh, they had uh, e-learning uh, to proficiency. So here the difference is they set a proficiency benchmark and they train those novices, which the number is 18, till they reach a proficiency uh, benchmark. They achieve that one, and then they are objectively assessed uh, again using the video uh, recording. Okay, so uh, as you can see on uh, on uh, the, the the traditional training compared to uh, proficiency-based progression training. So the percentage of trainees completed all five procedure steps, you can see there is uh, a big difference uh, from proficiency-based progression training to traditional uh, training. So from baseline to after in the traditional training, eight to 18 and 16 to 18 after uh, the training. Whereas six to 18 in the baseline, so the baseline is almost um, 
uh, not too bad, but after training using the proficiency-based progression training, so they're 17 out of 18. And uh, as you can see, this also is statistically significant. So those who are trained with proficiency-based progression training outperform those who uh, traditionally train. In the same uh, study, you can see regarding the steps and errors, again, they follow the same methodology of proficiency-based progression training. Those, as I said, they set a benchmark and they train those novices to reach that benchmark before the assessment. While in the traditional training, which is lack the uh, objective assessment, uh, so uh, uh, the traditionally per, uh, trained uh, people underperform compared to uh, the proficiency-based progression training uh, section. Uh, another kind of landmark uh, technique about robot assisted lower uh, anterior resection. And this is actually, this is Tony Gallagher who uh, developed the uh, simulation in surgical training. And this is uh, uh, the European expert consensus on a structural approach to training a robotic assisted lower uh, anterior resection using performance metrics. So the whole thing's about performance metrics performance metrics and uh, errors and um, setting a proficiency benchmark and then training in a simulation based uh, environment till the trainees or the novice achieve uh, the benchmark. Okay, and you can see that the metrics will look like this one. So um, uh, this is the, the, the steps. And obviously if you, if you didn't do that step, it will be an error. And critical error are those errors who endanger the life of the patient, while an error, uh, just uh, uh, just an error that means interfere with the success of the procedures. And you can see these are the type of um, uh, <coughs> metrics. You see how detailed they are, and they are defined in an unambiguous way that will not entitle uh, two assessors to uh, assess them differently. So using the, the assessment tool, you should be able to pick up the performance of the the performance of the uh, of the trainees. Okay, so they are very detailed, they're explicit and they are uh, formative. Okay, this is one of the uh, studies, but this is in the regional anesthesia uh, side. So, uh, and this study assess the effect of metric-based feedback on acquisition of sonographic skills. So using ultrasound also is one of those um, fine skills. It needs um, lots of uh, concentration, mental work, uh, and it's an, a skill that you have to, you have to get to be able to perform ultrasound guided. It's kind of, again, as I said, that the ultrasound, the introduction of the ultrasound te technology has placed a lot of pressure on the anesthesia training body to look for other ways of uh, of, of training. So in this study, the metric uh, are used to formulate a feedback uh, to give to those trainee to learn the ultrasound uh, guided peripheral nerve blocks skills. Okay. So why why it is difficult? Because it, actually it requires, um, as I said, intense cognitive interpretation of the visual cue. So it is it is a skill that you need to interpret the sonographic image to be able to introduce the needle and deposit the local anesthetic. So there is lots of mental strain on that one. So in this study, uh, feedback was used and feedback as defined uh, is an interactive process to exchange performance-related information. So an expert is there for one of the group to give them feedback, how to perform the things based on the, on the metrics. Okay, uh, so both groups after the training attempted, attempted to acquire ultrasound image for ultrasound-guided auxiliary brachial plexus block and Training uh, trained investigator conducted the feedback and the assessment. So the feedback was delivered by a trained uh, investigator uh, to give to that group. And as you can see, after testing time, these are the steps and these are the errors. Okay, and you can see that uh, the metric-based feedback group uh, outperform 
the other group, okay? So in post-training, those people, they perform less uh, steps compared to those people who were given metric-based feedback. And actually this, the metric used in this study was uh, validated in a previous study. So they are all already validated and their interreliability uh, rate was less than 80%. Okay, and you can see in the errors uh, part as well. So those people who were given metric-based feedback um, committed less errors than the counterpart. Okay, so the the usually the the uh, feedback and the deliberate practice that they formulate the core of the uh, curriculum in the uh, simulation-based training. So this is another study also investigated the role of deliberate practice using validated metrics uh, in the skill acquisition of the performance of ultrasound guided peripheral nerve blocks. Okay, why is that? Because needling skills again, same like the acquire, uh, acquisition of the uh, sonographic images is very critical to the performance, very critical to the success of the ultrasound guided nerve blocks. Okay. And so those novices were kind of divided into two groups uh, randomly. And those um, on the deliberate practice, they receive uh, practice supervised by a trained investigator. And the deliberate practice was based on the validated metrics. Okay. And then all candidates after that were assessed. And as you can see, again, when they come and assess them in terms of uh, number of the steps they perform out from that procedures. You can see that those who were given deliberate practice based on the validated metrics outperform the self-guided practice group. Okay, without obviously without uh, without metrics. And in the error section as well, so they perform uh, less errors than their counterpart. So, um, um, as you can see in the previous slides, this both in the surgical discipline and the anesthesia disciplines, uh, they attempted to undergo uh, metric-based or proficiency-based uh, progression training on simul in the simulation uh, environment to train uh, novices. This is one of the um, uh, meta-analysis and um, review uh, randomized and blinded clinical studies on proficiency-based progression training. So actually they uh, identified around 519 studies, but um, <clears throat> plus 525. So a large number of studies kind of according to their search criteria, but uh, they remove uh, over 460 uh, studies due to duplicates and then uh, record screened were uh, around four, over 460, and they excluded around 428, um, around 35 uh, studies kind of um, fulfilled the eligibility criteria. Uh, but among those, 23 numbers were uh, removed for uh, different reasons uh, in their methodology. So the final number of studies uh, included in the qualitative synthesis was around 12 studies and quantitative uh, synthesis around 12 studies. So a few number of studies, and this will indicate for you the uh, how much the methodology is very strict about the uh, proficiency-based progression training. So that methodology has to be followed as it is uh, for the study to yield um, uh, outcome, uh, favorable outcome. Okay, so they use the ratio of means between the study assessing the effect of proficiency-based progression training versus standard uh, training on procedural error. And you can see that uh, the um, they reduced the error by almost 60%. Okay, they found those studies who followed, these are 12 studies obviously, um, they are kind of mixed between surgical discipline and anesthesia uh, discipline, 
and obviously the reduction of the errors while quite significant clinically obviously and uh, statistically significant so the question will come whether those people who or those trainees who acquire their skills uh, with a proficiency based progression training is there any impact on the clinical outcomes and that is actually that is the ultimate goal we are looking for to improve patients outcome um well i mean improve patient outcome because once you 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 classify you characterize the procedure and define metric identify them then you set you validate them obviously and then you set a proficiency benchmark you use deliberate practice and feedback and you undergo a proficiency based progression during a simulated environment so those trainees will go into clinical practice so ultimately we are looking for improving the patient outcome. One of the few studies which kind of assess the patient's outcome is the, uh, the epidural study uh, by Serena Vastani et al. And that was done in Cork University Hospital in Ireland. And actually, um, as, as we all know that labor epidural is one of the uh, important skills that's acquired by uh, doctors to relieve um, labor pain and so this um, the the epidural procedure was characterized the metrics were developed identified validated and uh, through construct validity phase and contact validity and then they use those metrics into a proficiency based progression training uh, in a randomized uh, fashion and Interestingly, that uh, the error uh, committed uh, or the epidural failure rate was reduced by 54%, which is kind of a very significant uh, outcome. Uh, so those trained with a proficiency-based progression training, they outperform those who are traditionally uh, trained uh, and the, the failure rate reduced by 54%. Uh, percent. That's quite uh, significant and that will indicate to you how effective is the methodology of proficiency-based progression training. So in conclusion, the uh, traditional way of training, uh, see one, do one, uh, and teach one um, is no more uh, existing and we cannot follow it obviously because of the many things I have mentioned in the beginning. Uh, one of them is the, um, the expectation of the patient, the high profile errors, the reduction in the time interaction between uh, trainees and the patients. And that has come due to um, many reasons. One of them is the working time. Uh, one of them is the uh, pandemic, which we faced recently, uh, COVID-19, which reduced the interaction and the contact between uh, trainees and the and the patients and the safety of the patients overall so those trainees should achieve competency in a simulation uh, based environment and they certify it competent before they go and perform those procedures um, on patients simply they should not learn or train on patients this will form a better approach to use because simulation industry have offered us um, lots of technology, we, we, we have to use that one and it facilitates a risk-free environment for training. That is one thing. The other thing, it improves the confidence of the trainees and self-esteem because they, 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 they train to do those procedures in a stress-free environment before they go to the clinical situation and perform on patients. Metric-based simulation training to proficiency has um, given us a promise, a uh, hope that we will shift safely from time-based to competency-based uh, training. And as we have seen in the last few, sli few slides, that we can achieve superior clinical skills uh, with the simulation-based training, and definitely those superior clinical skills will transfer, when transferred to clinical practice, they definitely and positively impact on patient's outcome. Thank you very much. If there is any question, I can take it, please.